the good tactical stuff is there to learn. And that's what I did, which, but it's about getting over that fear. Like that's mm-hmm. all you have to do. And that was my biggest hurdle. And once I got over it, like growth just exploded. What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Creating Wealth Podcast, where I, Kyle, from Kyle Curtin Real Estate, interview local top dogs in the real estate investing, wealth building, and personal finance industries. Let's build together. What's up, guys? This week's guest on the podcast is extremely inspiring and is a next-level local investor. Today, we got the great pleasure to chat with Sean Winslow about some really great topics around mindset, eliminating those pesky roadblocks that we put in front of ourselves, growing quickly and standing out, and so much more. There's a ton to digest in here, some really awesome lessons, and I hope you enjoy. Before we jump in, would you guys mind please leaving a rating and a review down below? It definitely helps me grow the podcast so more folks can learn about creating wealth with real estate. Thank you so, so much. Now let's jump right into the episode. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 99 of the Creating Wealth podcast. Today, we get the great pleasure of chatting with Sean Winslow, an absolutely incredible investor in Southern New Hampshire as well as a founder and managing partner at Greenbrier Capital Group. What's going on, my friend? How are you, Sean? I'm super excited to have you on here. Hey, Kyle. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic, my man. Very, very excited to um, to kind of jump into more of your story and, yeah. and hear your, your tale to date. <laughs> hey, man. I always love chatting real estate with anyone and everyone. And, and if I can say one thing that helps someone else, you know, that's all, that's all that matters. Of course, man. I love it. So to kind of jump right into things, man, you know, tell us a little bit about you, like your, your upbringing, your backstory and, you know, kind of how you got started in the real estate world and tell us your story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So going way back, talking about my upbringing, I was, uh, I grew up in a small town in Vermont uh, to a family of entrepreneurs my dad, my uncles, my grandfather, all entrepreneurs. So I kind of got the early, that early itch, right? Um, and the classic, you know, lemonade stand. And then it, it kind of curtailed into like, I want, I vividly remember I wanted a new mountain bike, right? Because growing up in Vermont, you do a lot of stuff outside. And my dad said, Hey, I'll, I'll get you a new mountain bike, but I'll split it with you. You know, I'll pay half and then you got to find another way to pay the other half. So then, you know, that entrepreneur mindset kind of kicked in at back then obviously I didn't know what that was but I was like I need to find a way to make money so I started mowing lawns in the summers snow removal in the winters and I was able to buy that first bike but I'll, I'll tell you one thing that it taught me about money is you know I worked so hard to get that money and then I pretty much spent nearly all of it to buy a mountain bike and after <laughs> after after all this I was like what now it's all gone I gotta work again so it taught me that valuable lesson I think that was my dad's plan all along but uh to speed it up here then I ended up, you know, going to college, right? I think like everyone, the our society conditions us to go to college, right? So I kind of fell out of that. Not, not that anything's wrong with college, but I fell out of that, you know, entrepreneurial mindset. I went to college and knew I had to do good there so I could get a good job. I studied finance and then ended up getting uh, a, a job in financial services in Boston. I lived in Boston for about 12 years. And I think I just got stuck in that rut. But after a while, I just realized that that wasn't for me. Um, you know, I, I realized I was waking up every day. I was trading time for money to work for someone else's dream and not my own. And, you know, in the beginning, I didn't realize how, why I was in this rut, why I was feeling like not myself. Mm-hmm. And, but I, I re- eventually discovered that it was, it was because of those things. And, and I also, like, I love finance and I love investing, but I realized what I was doing wasn't the best avenue to create real wealth right? Most yeah. people just work 40 plus years, you know, pile money into a, an IRA and a 401k, retire with maybe a million, two, three, you know, and, and hope to live off, live off that. What, what is like, they, the, they say 4% a year, three, three to 4% a year. Like that's not the lifestyle I wanted to create. And that's not the investment I wanted to provide to people. So I, I knew there must've been, had to be a difference. And so I wanted to and interrupt me anytime you want, man. If you have questions, I know I'm I know I'm rambling here, but uh, no, I, I love it, man. <laughs> uh, 
I, I knew like I wanted to do something else and I really decided, okay, instead of just like thinking of like what career is next and just, you know, kind of just randomly shooting, I, I decided, hold on, let's create a life that I want to live and then create the work around it. Um, and so then I started thinking like, who's living a type of lifestyle that I want to live and how can I do that too? And there was two main things that you know, I wanted obviously money because you need money to live and do fun things. I love traveling. I love skiing. I love cars, you know, all, all things that cost money. So I knew I needed to make money and, uh -huh. and I also wanted to make money to give back to that's, that's important to me. And we can get into that later. But, um, the other thing I wanted was time. I wanted, and not just, not just time, like to do stuff after work or on the weekends, but flexibility of calendar. And so I started looking at friends, family, acquaintances I made along the way that, were successful when it came to like make, building wealth and making money, but also had flexibility in their calendar. They could, you know, at a drop of a dime, they could just, you know, do what they wanted to do and it didn't affect their business. And I was yeah. like, what do these people do? And it, and they all happened to be into real estate. So, you know, a light bulb went off. I was like, ding, ding, ding. And I'd always had an interest in real estate. I remember grow, growing up, my grandfather told me that, you know, he, he was successful in business and the stock market. But one thing he said always stuck with me is that his retirement would be living off the real estate he owned. So I was putting all these things together and I just realized this is what I needed to pursue. Um, but I was still in that, like that, you know, college school mindset and corporate world mindset. So what did, what did I do? What did Sean do? He went and took a real estate finance program um, <laughs> at Boston university at night while I was still working my finance job. And then when I got done with that, I started to apply to, you know, like private equity, real estate firms, more like corporate jobs. And then I just kind of just stopped and said, Sean, what are you doing? You know, part of the, part of the reason you're in your rut is because you want to build something yourself. So that's what I did. And I, I started building a smaller portfolio, as you alluded to in Southern New Hampshire. And now the majority of my portfolio is in uh, the Sun Belt, specifically uh, Georgia, Carolinas, and Virginia. Solid. I love it, man. That's, that's absolutely awesome. I love, especially too, like, you know, having that, um, you know, pretty cool, like way of growing up and everything with like entrepreneurial parents and like always, you know, kind of thinking a little bit differently than like, you know, the norm and everything like that's, that's wicked cool even to start off, you know, and it's, that's absolutely nuts, man. You know, and it's, it's pretty cool too, to, um, you know, just kind of be like, you know, skating through, like kind of, you know, taking the traditional path and everything and then starting to kind of act like realize like what else there is and like, you know, like real estate and like how you can actually start to take steps to go towards that and, you know, kind of everything that happened since, you know? So what, um, I guess what take me kind of through, you know, like you get out of college and everything and you like really want to take action with real estate. Tell us about, you know, kind of going and acquiring that first property, like, was it like a two to four unit, like house hack? Like, what was your, uh, what was kind of your starting off point? Yeah, man. So it didn't happen right after college. I, you know, I get asked the question a lot, or people ask the question, like, what would you tell your younger self? And I know the common answer is to start sooner. And that's true. That's what I would have told myself <laughs> because it took me about, I don't know, six plus years to actually start. Um, so I was working in my, my finance job, um, that whole time in Boston and don't get me wrong. I was having a great time making good money, um, learning a lot, but it, it just took me a long time to, to do it. Right. And it might've been, you know, limiting, limiting mindset, right. Limiting beliefs of, and just had to get over that. Right. And, and know that I could do it. Cause I think like a lot of people, I thought that you needed money, you needed to be older, you needed the know-how, the expertise to do this. And so I think that was just, I just put, I put that, that roadblock in my own way, you know, because there's obviously fear, right? And I think that's why a lot of people like that W-2, that corporate job, because there's that level of security, right? That they call it the golden handcuffs, right? You've got, like, this is a big institution, you know, very unlikely to go out of business compared to, you know, starting something yourself. So you've got that security and I think people just get stuck. And I, I think I just built that roadblock that I needed to get out of the way, out of my way. And I, I did eventually. And it was, I ended up getting, doing a, 
as in Boston, we call them three families, whereas everyone else calls them, you know, triplexes. I did a, <laughs> I bought, I bought a, I bought a triplex, um, in Manchester, New Hampshire. And that, that was my first deal. That's awesome, man. That's, that's super cool. And yeah, I mean, to your point, man, like it's, so I was actually at a, um, and this ties in with what I was going to say. So this weekend I went to, uh, like a three day, um, like mastermind, you know, like session type of thing with one of the groups that I'm in. And one of the things that I learned at that session, man, was basically like, like the real estate stuff isn't, and generally speaking, at least like the actual, like tactical, you know, like going through the hustle and bustle of doing the real estate almost like, isn't the hard part. Like the hard part might actually be your mindset and like actually going, you know, and like stretching yourself and like, you know, having those self-limiting beliefs of like, oh crap, man, you know, like I gotta be older or, you know, I need 20% down or like, you know, it's the market's not good enough or, you know, whatever the the case may be, you know, and it's almost like your mindset is actually kind of the hard part, you know, and like the self-limiting beliefs that are holding you back from, you know, getting that first property, those first couple properties. And it's, it was really an eye opener, man, you know, because like we're like us as human beings, like we're so much more capable, like, especially in today's day and age and everything. And to your point too, like, it's, um, it's almost like this stuff is, you know, it's, it's hard to find, you know, like, it's not like in the same river as like the, all right, you know, like you finish high school, go to college, go to work, be super comfortable, quote unquote, comfortable, hopefully retire at 65 and everything's hunky dory for a while. And like, it doesn't necessarily kind of skate into that, you know, as, as kind of a norm in in society, you know, but like, it's almost like once you kind of find like this kind of avenue, like you might be stuck down a a rabbit hole forever, (laughs) you know, and I'm, I'm very excited to be down that, that rabbit hole, but (laughs) yeah, I'm I'm with you, man. I I couldn't agree more. It, it's more about the mindset. That's the hurdle, you know, that that's what you have to get over. And then once you get over it, like things just happen, like to your point, the tactical stuff, you know, there's books on it. And now in, in today's day and age, there's countless hours of podcasts like yours, countless hours of, of YouTube videos yeah. that you can figure that stuff out easily. It's, but it is about the mindset and like, yeah. like think about this. So it took me six plus years to buy that first three family, that first triplex. Yeah. And then two months later, I bought a duplex that I house hacked. Then four months later, I bought another triplex. And then four months after that, I bought another triplex. And then two months after that, I bought a, a 14 unit portfolio. And then, wow. and then now I own over 400 units of multifamily and over 519 student um, housing beds. So that's, that's what can happen. And I'm no one I'm special gonna... guys. Like anyone can do it. Like the <laughs> tactical stuff is there to learn. And that's what I did, it was, but it's about getting over that fear. Like that's mm-hmm. all you have to do. And that was my biggest hurdle. And once I got over it, like growth just exploded. Yeah. You're totally right, man. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. You know, and like, even like, you know, to, uh, to kind of demonstrate, you know, like that point of like, all right, like it took me like the longest amount of time for the first one, but once you get by the first one, you know, then the time shrunk in half and half, and then like 75% and like, you just kind of keep rolling, you know, and it's, um, that's, they, they call they call it the law of the first deal. Um, and it's so true because, once you take the first one down, the first thing that happens is your mindset changes. Like, oh, I can do this. I just did. I can do it again. But what also happens is other people in in your environment, in your surroundings, in your circles, they get drawn to that type of energy, that type of mindset, and they see you close. They see you closing stuff. So, like a broker or a real estate agent, they see you close, and they're like, "Oh, Kyle just closed. Kyle can get me paid. Let's go give him a deal. Let's go show him a deal." Um, <laughs> lenders they think the same thing right um investors they think the same thing so it's so true just if you haven't done your first deal and you're listening to this the reason why is because what's in your head it's it's not because your abilities you because you can do the tactical stuff that that's easy definitely man absolute gold right there guys and literally man like the cool thing is too is um, like one of the other things that I heard quite a bit this weekend was like, just take the, the thing that's important is like just taking imperfect action and like failing forward. And like, it's like, you can't avoid failure. You know, it's, it's part of the game at the end of the day, it's going to happen from one point or another. Like 
you know, definitely guys, don't get me wrong. Like definitely, you know, do all the due diligence you can and everything and, and be smart, you know, and you're, you're out doing your thing, but like, you're not going to know everything when you first jump into a property, you know, like you're, you're going to get knocked around once in a while, but like paying that tuition and like learning those lessons is so important. Like, especially the earlier that you can learn them as well. Like, you know, as long as they don't bankrupt you and like, everything's cool, you know, like if you're able to, to take some of those smaller hits earlier on and be able to like, really, you know, start to get some things under your belt, get some experience there. And I guess start to earn some stripes, if you will, I guess, you know, like the power of learning that much earlier on and like being able to use that information and then leveraging that experience for the next one, like the sky's the limit, you know, and it's, like just take action, you know, just go figure it out. And like, you'll do it. Yeah, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd rather fail earlier on than later on because you've got a lot more to lose later on, yeah. right? If, if you built this huge empire, you got a lot more to lose. And, and plus, if you learn those, you know, if you, if you learn the bumps in the road, if you, if you learn that valuable information, cause that's what a failure is, is it's a, it's a learning event, right? You're going to learn something so you yeah. can carry that with you. So you don't make those mistakes later on. Not to say that you won't make mistakes later on, but you'll be less likely at least to avoid the big ones. And one, one piece of advice I will give is a great way to even limit the failures in the beginning is to surround yourself with people that have done what you want to do, you know? Yeah. So get a mentor, you know, it could be a paid mentor. It could not be. To me, it doesn't matter. As long as you get a, a mentor, that's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of headaches. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. And like, even if it's like an indirect mentor too, you know what I mean? Like, just like meeting with as many people as you can, like in your yep. market, like going to meetups all the time, just having conversations, like the more that you build those relationships, like the more that you're kind of protected from the unknown, you know? And like, if you're taking action anyway, and like, you know, like, like I said, like things are going to happen and stuff, but if you have the connections and the people that you can literally like just shoot a quick text or, you know, a quick call or something and maybe be able to get a little bit of advice on, you know, what you're dealing with. Like, it's absolutely huge. You know, it's, it's almost like a, um, you know, like, like being bulletproof or like a get out of jail free card or something like that, you know, like, yeah, like you're definitely still going to deal with everything that all of us have to, you know, from one point to the next. But if you have the people there to be able to like, you know, like talk to and, and kind of talk you through it and everything like, like, you're going to be fine. It's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, and yeah, yeah. who knows, like, it, it even um, I was talking to somebody earlier today that I was connecting with. And, you know, we were talking about like security deposits and stuff like that. And, you know, like the rules in Massachusetts and yada, yada, yada. And uh, I was telling him, I'm like, yeah, man, I'm like, you know, I never really knew anything about security deposits before. And when I was originally uh, shortly after I got this house, I'm like, oh, you know, like whenever I have to turn these units over, like, I don't want to deal with security deposits. Like I'll just do first and last and that'll be it, you know, cause I don't want to be liable, yada, yada, yada. But I learned, cause I actually wrote a Facebook post about it um, and kind of got people's thoughts of like, oh, you know, like, do you typically, you know, require security deposits first, last, like, what do you usually do when you're turning over your units and like, kind of what's your system? Um, and a lot of people were like, yeah, you know, like use security deposits all day. And obviously, you know, like it's, it's your decision. Like it's, you know, whatever you want to do is, is cool, whatever. But, um, one of the guys that responded or actually probably several of them were saying hundred percent security deposits and the way that you can make sure that's done hundred percent accurately in the state of Massachusetts. Cause guys, I'm not sure if you kind of know, you probably do, but in Massachusetts, like you have to be really careful with the security deposit laws. And like, it has to be like in an interest bearing account and like the tenant's name and like all, all kinds of lovely stuff that you have to abide by. But um, basically like these guys were telling me, they're like, oh, you know, security deposits all day. They'll like use this software called Z deposit. And I was like, oh, what's that? And uh, they were saying literally like, it's a completely free, um, program well free for landlords i think it's free for tenants as well but i haven't been on that side but basically like literally you make an account and it's connected to like several local banks in massachusetts like mine because i i turned one of my units over and i got a security deposit and i opened up this z deposit account 
and like I put my information in, the tenant put her information in. Did money got transferred over to Z deposit? Like I got a you know receipt and everything, and like everything's all linked up. So now like I just you know it's just sitting there, and you know whenever the situation changes, like we kind of deal with it down the line. But now it's out of sight, out of mind, you know. And I have a security deposit which protects you know us as as the owners, you know, from certain situations. Um, and it's, you know, it's guaranteed that everything's being handled hundred percent. Right. You know, so if God forbid something were to happen, that's something that should hold up, you know, in, in court or, or whatever it is, you know, and if I was trying to manage it myself, like who knows, <laughs> you know, but my, my long awaited point with that being like, I wouldn't have knew about something like that and potentially protected from issues down the line or potential issues if I never had conversations with, you know, just investors in our area and, and just connecting and just talking about what you're doing. Cause like, that's another big thing too, Sean is like, you know, make sure you guys like post and show like everything that you're doing. Like, you know, you definitely want to post those pictures of like, Oh, you know, I just closed on another building. Cause like, you never know who's out there and like, who's going to see that type of thing. And also who's going to want to join the journey with you. You know, or it could be like, you know, like you said, like it could be, you know, a commercial broker or like an agent or something or, you know, another investor that's trying to do a 1031 or like you never know, you know, and like social media, like it's nuts, man. Like literally just show people what you're doing, always be talking to people and like you're going to be a lot more protected as you start to move forward, you know, and it's um, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and I think that's a great point. I always say like, you know, when you meet someone, you know, the, the classic exchange is like, Hey, Kyle, how are you? You say good. How are you? And I say, I'm good. Right. Well, instead of just doing that, like, you're like, Hey, Kyle, I'm great. I'm actually looking for a hundred unit plus apartment complex in North Carolina, specifically in Raleigh or Durham. Do you know anyone that could help me with that? Like, yeah, that's awkward and not normal, but like, it, it's, it could elicit like a response that you're looking for. So not, why not take that opportunity to do that? Yep. And, and after a while, it's not going to feel awkward anymore. And it's it, like anything, it's a numbers game. And to your point on social media, hundred percent, like there's people out there that are, that are raising tens of millions of dollars yeah. simply by posting on Instagram, posting on Twitter, posting on LinkedIn, like, and I'm not exaggerating tens of millions of dollars. You know, I know someone who, who raised a $50 million fund and they did it off Instagram. Wow. Like, it's, it's possible, right? It, obviously, it, it takes a long time. It's not going to happen overnight, but it, it's worth it. Yeah, 100%, man. That's, that's nuts. You know, and like all just to kind of like record the journey and, you know, just kind of show people what you're doing. It's, it's a beautiful right. thing. It really is. <laughs> and, and, the, and the key is to, to just be your authentic self because... Yeah. You're going to attract the people that are attracted to that, right? And you don't want to attract the people that aren't. So why totally. be something that you're not? Just be yourself. Yep. Share the personal side of yourself as well. Don't just keep it all business because that's how people really um, connect with you. They're not just mm -hmm. going to solely connect just by showing business, right? They want to see the human aspect of you as well. So um, yeah, so I'll throw that out there. Exactly, man. You know, I mean, the the days old adage of like, you know, people do business with, you know, people that they like, know and trust, yep. you know, like, if you just put like your entire self out there and like everything like, you know, it's, you're going to start to establish some of these relationships like indirectly, you know, and it, it's just going to happen, you know, and it's, um, it's not 100%. So, Sean, just out of curiosity, man. And you could say like how much you want or like, you know, how much like you don't want to is totally cool too. like anything you want to share. So I'm kind of curious, like how you scaled up so fast, I guess, like after like you started buying like the first couple properties and then like things just went crazy. And like, like I said, like, it's, it's totally up to you, you know, how much you want to say, or <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> no, man, I'm an open book, man. Ask me what you want. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, man. So going into it, I knew I always wanted to be on the commercial side of multifamily. Yeah. Just coming from, you know, working in finance, just coming from that institutional space anyways, I understood the economies of scale and, you know, commercial for those, if you're not familiar, commercial trades off of NOI and a cap rate, right? So it's, you're buying the income of the property. So I think of, you know, a commercial multifamily, which is five, 
five units plus, I think of it as a, it's its own business, right? So you're buying that income that this business is producing that just so happens to be a piece of real estate. Yeah. Um, and so I just understood that and that if you increase the bottom line, it, it can exponentially increase you know, your, your sale price. So it just made a lot of sense. And then obviously having all units you know, in one area. So if you had a hundred unit complex, it's a lot easier to manage that than a hundred, you know, units spread out all over the place. Right. So I just understood those things also, you know, the power of leverage, right. And, you know, you commercial, there's non-recourse that's safer. I could, I could just go, I could rattle on why I like it, but <laughs> the, the point is all along, I knew I wanted to go big, but I needed to create some cash flow, some, some cushion. So I could leave my job in finance to really blow this thing up, right? Because I was licensed under FINRA um, in my day job. So I couldn't, I couldn't raise money for syndications and raise money for my finance job, right? Conflict of interest, just couldn't do it. So I needed to create some type of income. And I think it was also still a little bit of a limited, you know, mindset, limited beliefs there that, so I went and just started small multis, grew that up to about, I think it was like 25 units or so. Um, and then I left my, my day job. Right. And then I really focused on getting into the bigger stuff and how I really blew it up is we, we were talking about this earlier. I got a mentor, you know, I, I did a lot of research, um, you know, I looked for people that were, were, were crushing it, that were actually doing it now. I didn't want to just find someone that, you know, had done it years past and, and was, you know, coaching or doing whatever. Right. I wanted to find someone that was really doing it now you know, had similar values to me and, and did stuff that I like to do. Right. I just wanted to connect with that person. So I found a person and I wrote him a handwritten letter, sent it to him. Nice. Um, and I got that from, from actually from a few places from, from my, my dad, he used to do that. And also in finance, we used to do that to certain customers too. We thank them for their business. And we just, it, it's just one of those dark arts, right? It's like, it, it sets you apart. Not, not as many people do that anymore. Right. So I wrote him a handwritten letter and, and he loved it. Called me. He said, he said, Hey, that's my move. <laughs> and, 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 and he appreciated it. And then that's how we connected. And, and through him, I've been able to surround myself with really high quality individuals that are crushing it in real estate and other avenues too. And that's really the main reason why I've been able to really grow the portfolio. It's just surrounding myself with those people. They connect me with the right people. And again, it just goes to that that thing is like, you know, that energy. It just it just feeds off and surrounds the people that are that are making moves. So that that's that's kind of like the broad thing of I did. If you have any like tactical questions, I'm um happy to answer them. Yeah. That's that's absolutely beautiful, man. And it's, you're totally right. Like stuff like that, like that really personal, especially like, you know, actually handwritten type of stuff. Like it doesn't really happen much anymore, you know? And like, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know what I mean? To like, just do that kind of thing. Like even like just anybody in general, you know what I mean? Like regardless of, of who it may be, especially, you know, strong in the business world, like, you know, if, you know, if things go really well, like if you're like doing a deal or something together or, you know, whatever the, the case may be and things go good, like just, you know, sending them a little like, like, thank you. You know, that's like really personal and like, like really actually hits home. Yeah. You know, and I'm oh, sorry to, sorry to, cut, you off. <laughs> sorry to right. cut you off, but uh, I also, I, I do it. I don't just do it. I just did not just send it to him. I still do that today. Yeah. You know, investors, I'll thank them for trusting us with their hard earned money. Um, brokers, I'll send it to them either to meet them, you know, cause they get phone calls and emails all the time. Um, and to set myself apart, I would send letters sometimes with, um, Starbucks gift cards being like, Hey, this coffee's on me. The next one that's on me, I want to be in person and I'll give them my nice. card or contact information. And of course they're going to reach out. They don't, they rarely yeah. at all get that. Right. And yep. then what also I'll do is when we close on a deal, um, with I'll send the, the, the broker and, and the team, a handwritten letter you know, thanking them for, you know, awarding us the deal, trusting us and working with us. And one, I specifically will tell a story on one we closed on and I, I sent him that letter and he just so happened to have a kid maybe a month or two before that. And just so happened that his, his favorite team, the Atlanta Braves had just won the world series. So I sent him a, a thank you card 
with a um, Atlanta Braves World Series champions onesie. Wow. Uh, and he loved it, man. He That's like killer. probably a month ago, maybe he's a month ago, he sent me a picture. And I, I did this like months and months, like almost a year ago. Um, but like a month ago, he sent me a picture, maybe two months ago, of his kid in in the onesie. Aww. Uh, yeah. So like, you just got it, and it's and I'm not doing it to like you know influence him anyway. It's just you got to create yeah. those genuine you know relationships with people, yep. and it'll go a long way. Like, I'm looking at a deal from his team right now that he hasn't shown to anyone else, or at least he 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 claims to that because one, we have a property in that market. He wants to do another deal with us. And I, I know the price that I can take it down at. Now I'm, I'm waiting for them to, to season the property a little more before we do anything. But it, that's what gets you ahead in this game. That's what gets you to grow fast, you know, is setting yourself apart. It, it really goes a long way. And focus on relationships because that's what this business is about. Yeah. You, know, you, you said it earlier. People want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And that goes from every angle of this business. It's not just investors. It's brokers, it's lenders, sellers, you know, it's all of that. Totally, man. It it definitely uh definitely weighs pretty heavy, you know, the the more personal that, you know, and actually like, you know, I guess like deliberate or like intentional. That's kind of the more or less the word that I was looking for, you know, that, yeah, that yeah. you can be and, and like just genuinely caring, you know, and it's it goes a long way. It definitely does. So Sean, I do got one question for you that I like to ask everybody. And we might have dug into it a little bit earlier, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, how do you define wealth? Ooh, that's a great question, man. Um, <laughs> I think wealth can really be what you want it to be. You know, like what brings you joy? Yeah. Like, like someone, who's, someone who's dying of a, a terminal disease or a cancer, wealth is is time and health, right? Because they don't, yeah. they don't have, they don't have much of that left, right? Um, someone, someone who's homeless who hasn't ate in twenty plus days, wealth is probably that next meal. Um, so to me, to me, wealth is what. To me, really, what wealth is, is being able to have time. To do the things I love to do with the people that I love being able to have the money to take care of the people that I love whenever they may need it. Um, to me, that is true wealth. Um, at, at Greenbrier, part of our mission is to give a minimum of 10% of, of our profits every year to a cause that means a lot to us. Um, and, and so we aim to do that. And I, I think, you know, it's very important to create wealth to take care of yourself and your family, but it's also important to use that power and that time to make the world a better, a better place. Cause I think change really comes at the, the ground level with us citizens, right? Like we can argue all day long about, you know, politics and, and the bureaucracy, but we all know nothing gets done up there. It, it really comes down to us. And, and yeah. that's, what's important to me. And I think that's what wealth is. I love that, man. I, <clears throat> I absolutely love the perspective. You know, it, it really is, man, you know, and it's, I, I really like the, the points that you made too, of like, you know, people that might be in, you know, different situations that are, you know, kind of unfortunate and like, you know, the, the thing that might be at the top of their mind, you know, for whatever situation they're in, you know what I mean? And it's, it's just, it's perspective, you mm -hmm. know, and who knows? I mean, maybe, you know, like to, like you said, like someone out there, like maybe literally like, like a meal, you know what I mean? Is, you know, they have, haven't like eaten that much and, you know, like times are extremely tough and everything like, or, you know, someone that might've gotten a diagnosis that isn't at all what they were expecting or hoping for. And like, it, it might mean something completely different, you know, to like each of those people. And that's, that's a beautiful thing, man. I, I love that. Um, so to kind of transition to, um, let's talk a little bit about Greenbrier, man. I, let's tell, uh, tell the audience a little bit about it, you know, like how, how you guys started it, like kind of what your goals and stuff are. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> um, so Greenbrier, Greenbrier Capital Group, uh, our tagline is improving lives through real estate. I kind of just alluded to that. So 
improving lives on, on many different levels. One, obviously our investors, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is one of the best ways to grow wealth from a multitude of reasons. Obviously you got cash flow, appreciation, debt pay down, leverage. Um, you know, you've got what I call debt debasement where, you know, especially in an inflationary period, you are paying in nominal dollars. Your biggest expense is, you know, when you're taking debt is the debt, right? And that debt, if, if you buy fixed, which I think you should, uh, it's remaining fixed over 10, 20, 30 years while the everything's inflating, right? So it, it's so powerful. Um, and, and it can literally give you a huge headwind in, in growing wealth all while the tenant pays down your principal, um, your, your, I mean, your, your debt, which creates equity, right? Um, so that's one thing. We improve our lot, the lives of our investors. Two, we aim to improve the lives of our, our residents, um, both locally within the community, you know, renovating units, putting in really high quality amenities for them to use. Um, you know, one of the best feelings is when you walk on property and they thank you for imp improving the community like that, that means more to me than anything. It, it, oh. it just hits home when you do that. Right. Um, and then also proving, you know, improving the local communities, working with the local municipalities to, you know, imp improve the area. And then three, I spoke to this before is improving, you know, others' lives that are less fortunate. And that goes through giving away some of our profit. Right. And specifically, we like to focus on a few things, you know, human trafficking, child hunger, um, and my, my partner, um, my partner's wife is, um, her family is from Venezuela. And we know what's going on there. So eventually, we want to set up a fund that can help um, first her family and then other families in the country, either to provide them support there or find means uh, to get them out of that environment. Um, so that, that's what Greenbrier is. And, and the cool thing about it is we can do all that through real estate. And we, we, we focus on both multifamily and uh, student housing. Those, those are our two investment vehicles. Wow. I love that so much, man. Like it's, it's, it's really nuts, you know, how like just the, I guess like the, you know, situations and the lives that you can change through like buying buildings. You know, like it's it's so much bigger than like you know the the studs and the, the you know like the whole nine yards. Like it's it's interesting, you know, because like not to kind of talk talk about like me again, but like this one of the, the the things that you know I I learned this weekend as well was like you know so obviously you know like life is extremely short and you know it obviously like you know really matters like how much you're able to accomplish you know in the time that we're here. And it's, it's interesting because like every single one of us potentially, or I should say has the potential to use real estate as a vehicle to basically like, you know, it drastically improves the, improve the lives of ourselves, our family, friends, you know, whatever the, the case may be, you know, um, you know, charities and foundations and everything. And like literally just you know, live the life that you want to. And like, like everybody can win, you know, and it's, it's literally like real estate is literally just a tool to get to the place that, that we were meant to be, you know, it's, it's just kind of like something you, you use to get there, I guess. Yeah. You know, and kind of, um, kind of just make something bigger, you know, something like much bigger than yourselves. And it's nuts. It's, yeah. it's crazy to think about. True, true legacy, right? Yeah. Um, and like, I don't, I don't need to be remembered like that's not important to me but it the legacy to me would be able to just improve you know a lot of like a, others lives and their families lives and you know maybe it gets back that you know greenbrier did that but it doesn't need to get back that sean did that i just doesn't even need really need to get back that greenbrier did it it's just to me legacy is that you know i did something good and i left the world a better place yep. you know than when i got here so that that's what's important to me. That's what drives me every day um, to keep keep after it. Totally, man. I, I totally agree. 
So I got one more question for you, Sean. And that question is, do you read? And what is your favorite business, investing, or real estate book that you would recommend to anyone? Or a podcast or anything you consume? <laughs> oh, man. I, got, I could list off so many. <laughs> Yeah. This 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 podcast right here. You guys got to keep listening to this. Um, Aw, thank you so much, man. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> man, I don't know where I would where I would start on that. I, I I don't know. I don't know if anyone out there is like me that's listening, but you know, I always have like several books queued in my Amazon shopping cart. You know, mm -hmm. like <laughs> yep. I'm gonna order like three or four at a time, and they'll show up. And like, I just got so many that I need to read. Um, <laughs> Uh, can I can I give you a real estate one and sure. and a business one? Sure. Um, yeah. Since since we're both from the Northeast and we both at least at one time or another have, have lived in Boston, um, the real estate one I'll go with is called the Real Estate Game, and the reason why is it's it's written by an individual that uh, was a real estate investor in Boston and also a Harvard professor that taught real estate at HBS oh. at Harvard Business School. Um, phenomenal book. I think anyone should should check that out. I know it's one that probably doesn't get a lot of uh, recognition on, on podcasts. You know, people are usually going to say the purple Bible, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which technically really isn't a real estate book, <laughs> but um, it, it leads people to that. Um, for a business book. So right now, I'm not too far into it. I actually have it right next to me, but I, I have never split the difference. Nice. So far, it's so good, but I I haven't read enough of it to really, really say this one. I would say the E Myth. Um, Michael I think that's Gerber. A, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a great book. It just shows you that you know, business is really about two things: people and process. Right? What systems you have in place, and do you have the right people in place in those systems, in those processes? Right? And obviously, McDonald's is one that they talk about a lot. How they, you know how they were able to scale. So that's, it's a phenomenal book. I, I would highly recommend the e -Myth. It is, man. So I actually, I haven't, um, I never heard of um, that first book there with the, uh, yeah. yeah the, that never split the difference. Oh, so it was um, the Boston, um, the oh, oh, professor's oh. book. Yeah. I, I've never heard of that, man. I'm definitely going to check that one out. I think I have it on my shelf back there, but uh, yeah, man, it's, it's the phenomenal book. Um, Last name, I think, is Purview. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But yeah, he's, I don't know if he still is, but he was a Harvard, uh, HBS, Harvard Business School professor, taught real estate, but was also a real estate investor within the market. That's where he started before he became a professor. Solid. Yeah, yeah I'm definitely going to check that one out. I, I have her read Never Split the Difference and yep. the e-myth and the e-myth changed my life man like that was that was another like punch in the face into like a different like <laughs> you know into like kind of the yeah. next step yeah. you know yeah another one that did that to me too was um i recently read it who not how i'm not sure if, yeah. if you've read that oh i just had it i haven't seen it over there yeah 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 <laughs> that's that's a big one instead yeah. of yeah that just changed just that mindset it's it's not about it's not about how do i do it it's who do i know who do I know that might know someone that could do this way better than me? So. Mm -hmm. That book's a game changer, man. An absolute yeah. game changer. But, um, but yeah, thank you so, so much for coming on here, Sean. That was absolutely awesome, man. We're on um, like social media and stuff. Can like you, Greenbrier, like anything yeah. that you want, I'll drop below. Hey man, I appreciate that. And, and thank you so much for having me on. This has been fun. Uh, great. This is a great, great show. Great oh. interviewer you guys got here. So, uh, <laughs> Um, you can find me, well, Greenbrier, just Greenbrier CG, CG is for Capital Group, greenbriercg.com. Um, I also have a podcast, the Multifamily yes. Money Podcast on all, all places you can listen to podcasts and where you can connect with me personally is two spots. One, Instagram, the handles at Sean Wins, R-E-I, and then on LinkedIn, just search my name, Sean Wins, and I'll pop up. That's awesome, man. Yeah, real quick, man. Tell us a little bit about the podcast. I, I thought you mentioned earlier, like that you were a host and stuff. I'm like, tell us all about that, man. I'm curious. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so multi multi family money. Um, yes. Two episodes a week. Uh, Mondays we got multi family Mondays. That's everything about multi family investing. I share my journey, my thoughts on the market. You know, I'll I'll jump on and talk about maybe a, some situation we have at the pro one of our properties. 
or how I got a deal, how I closed a deal, how I funded it. Also bring on people to interview that are crushing it in the multifamily space, um, whether it be other investors, lenders, brokers, um, asset managers. And then on Fridays, it's finance Fridays. So I came from the finance world. So it's, you know, it's, it's all about not what you make necessarily, but what you keep. So I like to bring in a little personal finance on Fridays to kind of give some people some tips and tricks on how to get your money working better for you. Man, that's killer. Guys, go check that out. I'm about to subscribe once we hop off the call, but uh, thanks, <laughs> definitely going to check that out. Guys, go go listen to Sean's podcast. That sounds amazing. Hell yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> but alrighty, my friend, thank you again so, so much. I, I will talk to you soon, Sean. Thanks, Kyle. See ya. All right, guys, that concludes our Creating Wealth podcast episode for today. I want to thank every single person that has listened this far. It really means a lot to know that people can learn from me and with me as we build wealth together. Hopefully you can take home at least one thing from this podcast that will improve your life just a little bit. If you could, please check me out on social. That's at Kyle Curtin Real Estate on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm on Bigger Pockets. Until next time, let's build together.